Okay, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most common systems for simple harmonic motion, or any harmonic motion, the pendulum. And we're going to start off by talking about an ideal simple pendulum. Now, when we say ideal, we mean that there's going to be no friction, and there's going to be no air resistance or any drag. And when we say simple, we mean that in this pendulum, it's going to have a very thin string wire that's always going to be taut. You can say that it's a wire of length L. And we're going to say that all of the mass, or well, all the mass that we care about, is going to be concentrated at this bob at the end. So we can say that this is the bob of mass M. And that the mass of the wire is negligible compared to that of the bob. Now we know from everyday experience of like seeing pendulums, a pendulum is most stable at the very bottom where it's not moving, and we can dis if we displace a pendulum by an angle theta, it's going to oscillate back and forth, and this bob is going to move along a nice circular track. Now since we're moving along a circular track about one axis of rotation, this is going to be a rotation. <laughs> kind of gave it away there. But since it's a rotation, we're going to be dealing with torques in the system. And just a brief refresher, a torque is going to be given by the distance from the axis of rotation to our force, let's just say L for now, times the tangential component of our force. We're going to see what we mean in a little bit. So in order to find out what the torques are in the system, we first have to understand what forces are in play for this pendulum. Well, the only force that we're really going to be concerned about right now is gravity. And gravity is going to be going down. So here's our force of gravity. But if we want to find the torque, we're going to need to find the relevant component of our gravity that's helping this mass move along the circular track. So we're going to resolve this force of gravity vector into two components. One that is radial, and along the radius, we're going to call this F of R for F radial, and one that is tangential, goes tangent to the circular track. We're going to have our tangential component Ft. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with some basic geometry, you can try and work out that this angle here is going to be the same as this angle here. It's going to be angle theta, which means that our radial component is just going to be equal to our force times cosine theta, and our tangential component is going to be equal to our force times sine theta. Now it's the tangential component that we're actually interested in, because that's the component that's going to be moving this bob along its circular track and helping it rotate. So let's just plug that up here. We're going to say that our torque is going to be equal to the distance L times our force, which is just the force of gravity, which is just mg, times this sine theta to make sure we are only dealing with the tangential component. So now let's take a look at our rotational version of Newton's second law. We're going to say that the net torque is going to be equal to the moment of inertia times our angular acceleration alpha. Now, what's the moment of inertia for this system? This is where we use the approximation that this pendulum is simple, because this is essentially one point mass. And for a single point mass, uh, rotating about some axis of rotation, I, or our moment of inertia, is going to be equal to m, the mass, times the distance from the axis of rotation squared. So we're going to say I is equal to ml squared. So let's plug that in here. So ml squared times our alpha, which is equal to the second derivative of our displacement theta with respect to time, and that's going to be equal to our net torque. Now, 
I nearly forgot to do one important thing. I forgot to assign a direction. So let's say that it's a right-handed system, which means we're going to define our moving counterclockwise is going to be a positive torque. Now, essentially what that means is that for this system, our torque is going to be negative, and then this value up here, L, M, G, sine, theta. Essentially because, I forgot to mention up, up here, I really should have, but the torque is going to be in the opposite direction of our displacement. So if this is going to be positive theta, this will be a negative torque. And over here, we'd have a negative theta and it'd have a positive torque. So now we have this equation here. Let's simplify it by dividing by ml squared on both sides. We're going to get that one of the m's will cancel and one of the l's will cancel and we'll be left with the second derivative of theta with respect to time is equal to minus g over l sine theta. Now at a first glance this kind of looks like the differential equation for simple harmonic motion but that differential equation was just the second derivative of displacement with respect to time minus, sorry, is equal to minus something times that displacement. Here we have that uh, second derivative of displacement with respect to time is equal to minus something times sine of that displacement. So it's not quite the differential equation that we're used to working with. But we can do one approximation. And this approximation is going to use a, our Taylor series expansion for sine theta. Now, I'll hopefully get around to doing a video on this, but you can compute the actual value of the Taylor series expansion for sine theta, and that's going to be equal to theta minus theta cubed over 3 factorial plus theta to the 5th over 5 factorial minus theta to the 7th over 7 factorial, etc., etc., etc. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use an approximation we used in earlier videos with Taylor series expansion. We're going to say what if theta is small. If theta is small, then theta cubed is going to be really small, theta to the fifth is going to be even smaller, and theta to the seventh is going to be way, way small. So if theta is small, we can say that all these higher order terms are so small, they're negligible. In which case, for if theta is small, we can say that sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Now, just to provide context by what I mean by theta is small, is typically up to angles around like a quarter of a radian, which is about something like 15 degrees. That's what we mean. So let's use that approximation for our pendulum. So under the proviso that we have small displacements, less than 15 degrees for our pendulum, we can use this approximation and plug it into this differential equation. So we can get that the second derivative of theta with respect to time is equal to minus g over l times theta. Now, this is the differential equation form that we're all used to working with, and we know that the solution is going to be theta as a function of time is equal to some amplitude times cosine omega t minus a phase phi, with our angular frequency omega, that's going to be given by the square root of this term, so it's equal to the square root of g over l, and we know that this will oscillate back and forth with a period equal to 2 pi divided by our, our omega, which is equal to 2 pi times L over G. Well, so there we did it. We found the, that the simple pendulum uh, undergoes simple harmonic motion under the provisor that the displacements are small. Now, I just want to point out two things. The first is a bit of an interesting thing. If you take a look at the period, that's the time it takes to complete one oscillation. 
Notice it only depends on the length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity. It doesn't depend on the mass of the ball we use. So if we have two pendulums of the same length, but one of them was 100 kilograms and another is 10 kilograms, they'll oscillate back and forth with the same period. That's pretty neat. The other thing is you might have felt that we kind of copped out a bit by using the small angle approximation because we don't always use pendulums with just small displacements. And in that case, there have been a lot of work to try and figure out what the equations of motion are for a bigger displacement. One of the most important, or one of the more important approximations that you might have heard of is the Bernoulli approximation, which tries to find out what the period is under larger displacements. So, that's what we're call it a day for now. In the next video, we'll talk about different forms of pendulums. So I'll hopefully see you in the next video.